Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Episode 27, Perspectives from a Music Therapist, Magic in Music, and Perfect Pitch. Well, hi, Melinda. And it's so nice to get back in touch with you. Uh, what was it, just a week ago or so? A couple. And, yeah. And uh, you're an old... Uh, Mansfield University, one of my friends, one yes. of my, you know, true group, uh, we had a pod. <laughs> so, and prior to me, you know, getting in touch with you over the past couple of weeks, it was probably like 40, 39 years. And we just went right back to... I know, home. we fell right it, back in, which is it, great. It's, wow, that's awesome. It's just... You know, yeah. you can't make this stuff up about you your best and, you know, friends in college. We essentially, we essentially haven't changed. Changed our personalities are still the same. <laughs> My voice is the same. Your voice is the same. It's just, our, it's great. Most of our remembrances are the yes. same. <laughs> There's just so much. I know. But you called me because you said I'm retiring or retired. I'm retired. And. And you said, so I want to find out about getting a PhD. And I'm like, well, that's what Bo said to me not too long ago. So this is what really? you guys have in common. I did not know that. I didn't surprise, yeah. surprise. You that's got surprises cool. for him cause you, and, and me because I don't know the story you're going to no, share a little later. No. Yeah. But I thought we'd take a divergent, um, you know, ricochet off of what we do. Uh, uh, normally on the podcast and have a conversation with somebody who's got an inkling of music learning theory and has an inkling of of audiation, likes a little bit of the concepts, but it hasn't really, um, we haven't really had uh, conversations about it. And I thought it would be great for people in the music education world, which we have like 300 all over the world. Oh, two, cool. Two in India. One in, really? like, one in New Zealand, two in Australia. You know, we're, we're, like, we're like a big deal when you look at our di- diaspora. That's but it's, cool. It's, it's that like two, really cool. 200. That's, and now that's hopefully cool. 201 plus all, all, your, all your friends. Yes. <laughs> cool. So I it just, just today. started the downpour just now. So it might, oh, might wow. be really noisy. We have tornado potential yes, warning kind of stuff so I just ignore that. the background noise yep. and i just have to tell you i just substitute top this morning it was a half day so i'm like fresh from the context yeah yeah so, so yep. bo what do you want to know about melinda just like what what questions you have off the bat yeah like what, you want to well i guess i guess it'd be interesting to hear about your music background maybe from when you were a kid up up through your education and okay stuff like that, just so we have some idea of yep of, yep yeah. I would say the earliest instruction outside of school that I had was starting piano lessons at uh, at the age of nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I stayed, you know, I kept piano all through till like today. And then along the way, I added on a clarinet in fifth grade. Switched to bass clarinet and never looked back <laughs> to this to, to today. And then I added, you know, like other woodwinds. I played cello in eighth and ninth grade, which I, I love and would like to take back up. And then, you know, knowing that I was going to go into like a music field in college, you know, mm-hmm. just all the methods classes. I was sort of like a music therapy major with a music ed minor. For my undergrad so i took all those methods classes and all that music ed stuff so in order to try to get everything in for both majors i had to cram cram everything in every semester plus a summer and uh then um after graduation and my clinical training i got a job as a music therapist and, and that worked as a music therapist for 16 years Wow. And then at the end of that, I was, but, but it had morphed and the, 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 the amount of actual music therapy that I was doing steadily decreased over those mm-hmm. 16 years. So like by like mm, 2000, I was like, 
out of an eight hour, eight and a half hour day, I'm lucky if I did two hours of actual music therapy. So I was like, I didn't, oh, okay. I didn't go to college to, <laughs> I didn't pay all that money and spend all that time to be, to spend my days this way. So yeah. I went back, I went out on a limb. I, 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 I quit. <laughs> I applied to Mansfield and all I had to do was my student teaching. So I was a student teacher at the age of, I can't even, I can't even do the math right now. Uh, 30 <laughs> something. I don't know. But anyway, then I got my New York state teaching certificate. Then I switched over and became a music educator, you know, working in the public schools and then mm -hmm. I did that up until I retired. I'm bringing you right up to date. And uh, I retired four, four years ago. And since then, as far as teaching, I've been substitute teaching, including today. And then I just okay. do stuff like gigs, private instruction, performances, mm -hmm. whatever, kind of whenever I feel like it, because I'm retired. So I can just pretty I much know a lot of the substitute teachers in this area for the band programs uh, specifically end up being retired teachers. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested about your music therapy background, because I would imagine that influences your how you practice and how you play and how you teach people massively. Most, um, most definitely. Yeah. In, in So in Vancouver, where I am uh, in Canada, uh, Capilano University, uh, from what I'm told, has a really good music therapy program. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a few people that have gone into it. I, I haven't been in that world at all. I've, I've done a lot of the uh, I've, I've done a lot of trying to bring mindfulness concepts and all that kind of stuff into into playing and practicing. But um, yeah, I'd be very curious to hear just some more about um how music therapy has affected your own your own playing of music and, and teaching because I would imagine it would have a huge oh impact. my gosh it affects my teaching <laughs> directly sure like, like I would say the, the the district that I teach in it's also where I live like I'm telling you Bo if I take a stone and throw it that way bloop I'll hit the high school if I take a stone and throw it that way bloop I'll hit the middle school so I'm like right at like yeah. Ground zero. If I throw it this way, bloop, I hit the high school football field. <laughs> uh, so I'm like at, at, at ground zero. This would be considered an urban district. You know, they sort of classify it Title I, how many kids get free lunch. You know, that's how it's classified. So mm -hmm. Poughkeepsie City School District, where I live in the state of New York, this district is, you know, falls into that category. Uh, so... I would say kind of humorously, but seriously, huh, I have found in my years of teaching in this district there, you guys, there is a thin line between the populations of this age group that I worked with as a music therapist and the K through 12 population in, in this district. And by that, I mean... When I was a music therapist and worked with, say, like teens, you know, like, say, 13 to 18, and they were in a juvenile facility, they were in a DFY, Division for Youth, they were in um, a home because they were in and out of foster care and stuff like that. Working with those populations as a music therapist, I found how easily and how readily and how necessarily I employed the skills working with those populations in an eighth grade middle school classroom. Thin mm -hmm. line, a thin, broken, fuzzy, blurry line. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, which, I mean, I've, I've experienced I love. this as a... I loved it. I, you know, I, I loved it. I love, you got to have a certain kind of personality to mm -hmm. enjoy working in a district, you know, such such as this and out of when i was still working out of all 11 teachers in the department you know i i love urban district middle school are you crazy no i love it i'm telling you i to this day even though i'm retired i still love it i still try to exert whatever help i can yeah, you gotta it. be brave. You have mm -hmm. thirty kids with brass instruments in their hands, right? I I, I love <laughs> it. 
You canceled on me to go teach last week. What'd you say, Eric? You canceled on me to go teach last week. Yes, yes, I did at the same school, the same school that I was at today. But today's a half day, you know, because of the Memorial Day weekend. So they had a half day today. Yeah. Awesome. So you have an anecdote, and you can let us know. Do you want to? Yeah. So you know what, you guys? I'm going to... I'm going to just tell you this story in, in layman's, laywoman's terms. Then you guys tell me what scientific theories and practices, audiation, music learning theory, inherent, oh, I'm excited already. <laughs> inherent innate <laughs> stuff happened. Because I love this story. I got goosebumps. So, okay. Uh, you guys might not get goosebumps, but I'm telling you. All right, so today's the 27th, so two weeks ago, two Fridays ago, on Friday the 13th, the same school that I subbed at today, I subbed, I've subbed. i been subbing at for like the past three Fridays, go figure. So I had a second grade class, and the school at which I've been subbing is the same school that I taught at full time for 10 years. So I'm familiar with all the teachers, familiar with the setup. It's like I never left. Okay, so I got a class of second graders. The current music teacher never uses a hello song. But when I was teaching, every grade had their own hello song, and I would teach it, you know, kindergarten and first grade was the same one. But other than that, up to fifth grade, they all had their uh, their own hello song. So I'm like, I'm gonna teach these. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this hello song with the second graders. So before they came in, I had the the lyrics to the song up on the smart board, and it's uh, to the tune of uh, when the saints go marching in. So I've got the words on the on the smart board. Uh, uh, I, I have to sing it for you, so because otherwise it'll yeah, help with yeah. the story. So it's I'm gonna sing it in low key because I'm tired. We sing hello, we sing hello, we sing hello to you today. Thank you for coming to music. We're so glad you're here today. Okay, and then there's stuff after that. So I have those lyrics on the board. Now the kids don't know the song yet. All they see are those lyrics on the board. So, and you know, this is like 18, seven year olds. Keep keep that in mind. They come in, they sit down. Hi, Miss Aaron. Hi, how are you? Do you guys want to learn a hello song? Okay, first we have to figure out the, the lyrics. So I turn around, I grab a xylophone mallet to use as a pointer, and I'm pointing to the words so they can read as a group. And I start pointing, and they're going, we sing hello, right? I don't know if I can describe this like a- a- adequately, but I'm just pointing to the words. They're reading as a group. If there's like six lines of lyrics... By the time I got to the bottom line of lyrics, they were reading with rhythm, which I hadn't taught them yet, and some melody that they collectively spontaneously came up with because I hadn't taught them yet. And so I wish I, I wish you guys had been there. That's the only way. So they're going, we sing hello, and I'm pointing, and then they're going, we sing hello, and I don't know how it happened. But by the third line of print, as a group, they were reading the lyrics with pitch and inflection that matched and a rhythm. These notes came out of nowhere, you guys. And this rhythm came out of nowhere. Spontaneous creation of, 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 of melody and rhythm and all Miss Aaron was doing was standing there with a xylophone mallet pointing and as they as they got closer to the end I started to jump out of my skin because I was like oh this is so cool ah and then I I just so we got to the end and I I I, I put down the mallet and I was like you guys I didn't even teach you the song yet and you're already singing it's not the melody I was going to teach you, but you're already singing. And, and 
the what's the word I want to use? Like the, the 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 glee, the pride and accomplishment. And you know, these are like seven year olds, which is young for me because I'm used to middle school. There, you could just see it, you guys. They're like all looking around, like yeah. Miss Erin likes what I did. Look what I did. And they're kind of looking around and kind of high-fiving each other. And I, that's, that's my anecdote. And, and all I can say is I had goosebumps. I was jumping out of my skin. When their teacher came to pick them up, and their teacher is a friend of mine because this is the school that I worked at, and I said, your class. And I described to her what happened. And uh See how excited I got just telling the story. <laughs> I, I definitely, I definitely understand why you got excited. I, I had have some that ideas class for again sure. today, and now they're like, "Miss Aaron, remember that time when we?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yes, I do." It was, it was, it was great. It was. That's that's my story. I'll tell it to anybody that wants to hear, it, even if they don't. I'll tell them anyway because it was. <laughs> they're a better yeah. person after hearing my anecdote. <laughs> that's it. I, I think. What was I that work it's, it's, there, you guys? Well, it's something that we've been talking about lately and that's been on my mind lately is is how how linked up music is with actual spoken language, not just not just the analogy between music being a language and speaking language, but actually how de- uh, dependent they probably are on each other. Because when you have uh, lyrics on a board, and it's it's probably perfect you have the lyrics written up there, it, there's different ways you can say those lyrics in terms of rhythms, right? So there's many different. You could you could sing those lyrics in different meters and different in different rhythm patterns, everything, and um, you know that that makes total sense to me that they would they would kind of start spontaneously developing a, a form of it. I've actually I've tried this with students who are um, I have I have a lot of guitar students from this area who I'm teaching like jazz improv to, mm-hmm. and when they when they come at it from a very theoretical like chord and scale you know in their mind kind of relationship they often don't make phrases that make musical sense and one thing i've done with students is actually just get them to either take the lyrics to a song a different song and every time they play a phrase it has to use the rhythm pattern or some kind of rhythm from that set of lyrics or they can just invent their own lyrics at off the top of their head and i find a lot of people that don't make musically coherent statements when they improvise when they use words like just if i was thinking bam, 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 like <laughs> jump right here you know i'm just i'm just making up words uh-huh. in my head or making up phrases the the music seems to be improvised at a, at a higher degree than if they don't uh, use that right. and so uh, that's been on my mind a lot for the past five or six years yeah uh, so i'm not but it's cool that it it translates even down to you know the level of just very young kids and I'm, and I'm sure Eric, I mean, Eric, out of all of us, I think has the most experience by far with young kids. With early childhood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what, do you, what do you think, Eric? Like, what's going on there? So, first of all, kudos to the music education department or the teacher that had these kids because they're listening to each other. That's the number one thing. It's like I'll make sure to tell her that. <laughs> just the kids are listening to each other. And so they've created a musical, you know, entity by being in that class. Now, it could be an exceptional class because they, you know, got that teacher or also you got a little bit more of the kids who are uh, really engaged than normal or plus not only being engaged might tilt the scale a little bit, might be an odd class and that there's more kids of their higher aptitude, more creativity, more, you know, uh, Plus, on top of that, a lot of those kids wouldn't be higher aptitude if they didn't also have musical households before mm. they got to school. So prenatally, mm. the last trimester, um, mm. there's a lot of music growth, I swear. Uh, I can't ever find a, a kid who's off the scale musically. I rock, walk right up to their mom and I said, you were singing, dancing like an animal while this kid was still in your belly. And I tell them flat out, that's what happened when I find a, you know, one of these kids that's like at two and a half or three years old, moving with such energy and flow in their body and just like reminds me of like, you know, this guy's a, a master <laughs> of, of tempo and meter already and, and plus the style that he's showing me. And wow. it's rare that you get these kids. It's one out of a few hundred or a few thousand even. Um so, 
you don't know where these geniuses are unless you hunt for them. This is one of my goals as a music teacher, mm -hmm. you know, with, with three, four, five-year-olds. It's like, I'm looking for, you know, how, how, how hard can I push these kids? Yes. So, so the other thing that might, might account for that, besides these other possibilities, and Lord, we're not going to know, mm -hmm. um, you know, unless we go back and take that class and send home surveys and actually do some real sophisticated well they're you know, right here statistical research and <laughs> then could be part of my pseudo doctorate qua qualitative research uh go in there and just interview kids interview families interview like that. grandparents like what that I all that did i would love to do that and and so so somewhere between their early childhood mm -hmm. and then the the community that got built in that school and then the, there's a possibility that some of those whatever song they sang was conglomerates of all the repertoire they might have gained and they so and now there's this other thing that that's an if interesting you, point that you just they just it, went by there yeah yeah and here's this and there's one other thing melinda just start to talk me me yep yep, yep. my my mic Mike, is picking Mike, up like Mike, Mike is picking up yes you know, you know i can do i can, I can do this right, right? You just talk, talk right but right, right behind you musically it's easier for me oh i see what you're saying yes okay you, okay. you know a millisecond behind yes. you i can do that in music so much easier than in language and so mm -hmm. once there's a singer singing my part in the choir i'm good put me you know in front of the concert choir and now sing the bass line by yourself with you know Melinda on <laughs> on alto, right? And you know, pick, yes. pick four people in the court and, and yes. to make me sing my part. We no, had to it's do not that. happening. It's not happening. Right. Not unless I'm really audiating well my part. Um, I can sing with. I could sing anything if there's somebody right next to me. I rely on the keyboard. It's a shame that I do, but mm -hmm. I just don't. It's not a like, shame. I'm not confident. That's not a shame. Well, well, I'm not confident with my voice. My voice has always been something I don't like necessarily about myself in my teaching. Mm -hmm. It's like the quality or mm -hmm. the, you know, or whatever. But I could make up for that in so many other oh, things. Because I just get the kids yes. to do. And because it's my weakness, you know, it's like something I always pound on the kids. But what I'm saying is that millisecond between somebody creating there's a leader in there and those kids somebody was yep. a leader yeah and it, oh and i it, would and love it, to oh and you're it proliferated right. it proliferated quickly and it's magical when it there, happens there could even you're have been a couple right there, yep. there could have been there yep. could have been one kid kind of invented the rhythm for the yes. first phrase and then everyone else and then just, that and then that is it, so cool it just yeah it just set you off yes. you know it set off the chain reaction it's like mouse traps when all of a sudden yes. they go you know um so there's a ton of different potential, yeah. but but when it comes together, it is magical. It's, and that's there the is only way I could describe it was magic. There are differences between performances of the same orchestra playing the same dang piece, and you go in and you're unmoved, and another, you know, on one night, and the next night you are crying. And it's because of something that we don't really get to um, study or understand because it's kind of ethereal and magical. Uh, you know, uh, when Paul and I went to go see uh, Paul Winter with, I don't know what group of friends, you know, there's a high that you get that doesn't exist any other way than <laughs> listening in a particular way with a group of friends. And that's yeah. happened to me, you know, maybe a few dozen times because I go to the jazz festival. Yes. You know, uh, and, 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 we make it happen there because they're bringing in, you know, Aretha Franklin, yes. Ray Charles, you know, Dave Brubeck, you know, name, name a hundred people, yes. you know, Victor Wooten, the, the, the R and B groups, yes, temptations. Yes. And like, yep. it's just a magnetic party that creates a, Isn't right. That, so what is that? that is, what is that? And know, why does it happen? It's so cool. And, and there's some nights where the same band is there yes. and it's just like, yeah, hey, I'll go see what's happening at the backstage. I don't, you know, I'm not digging it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and I don't know, yeah. like, how do you define groove? How do you define that kind of core listening uh, among, um, you know, what I think I that, that group, that group versus core listening is very interesting. Um, it, it's something that shows up in, in a lot of different genres. I've, 
I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of high school kids that I teach. They seem to have this very like not in a not in a mean way, but it's a self centered listening. When they have an instrument in their hand, they naturally listen to what they're playing very closely yep. and they hear it very closely especially if they know their part by memory yep. or or by recollect they can really predict what they're going to play and they listen to it but their awareness of what the rest of the band yes. is playing My might yes. not be very high like how often can the tuba player like hum the flute part you know and and <sighs> I, I, I start it starts to get to the point where are they really all playing the piece oh if they don't goodness. know each other's or, parts oh right? my goodness oh my goodness so <laughs> so oh my goodness Bo. I oh I know what you mean about the self-centered thing because okay so recently let's see from mid-January to mid-March I was like a long-term like leave replacement sub right here at the high school where I can throw a stone for the band teacher uh they they you know he and his wife had a baby so he was out for like daddy leave um and so I had, you know, he has two two bands, wind ensemble and concert bands, two bands. And that thing that you just said, I I made them do it. Like, okay, let's break this piece down. You know, start at measure 42. Listen to has the melody. Okay, it's the alto saxes. Now, start at measure 58. Listen to has the melody, and now it's the trumpets. And like, you know, mm-hmm. they were they were kind of, like, did, you know, did you know that they had that part before? Yeah, it's the yeah. melody. Now it's the alto sax's turn. Now it's the trumpet's turn. Now it's the the baritone's turn, you know? And they probably... I think that's a great exercise. They, they, they didn't know that before. So then it's like, okay, yeah. you guys, they're, you're familiar with the melody because you hear it in the beginning. Now, when you get to measure 58, be aware that... The trumpets are playing it now, even though you're over here in the yeah. alto sax section or, or or whatever. I don't know if they ever did that before with their regular teacher, but yeah. I thought it was important for them, just like you said, you know, to know what's going on. Like, you know, baritone player, could you could you sing what the alto sax just had there? You know? Yeah. yeah. That's, I think there's really two good. there's two things that come to mind when you mention that is, is one it's it's very useful if you're a band teacher and you need like the, the the trumpet section for example to play a melody a few times in a certain section to iron it out mm-hmm. rather than having the rest of the band like disengage and wait for their time to play you can kind of give them a, a task of you know can you guys sing along with the trumpets Ooh, while they play their thing that's because then a they, good idea. and I think that's the that's that's a good use of their time rather than just yes then just because I have a lot waiting. of students that report in band they kind of just feel like they're they're just like waiting and they're on their, their phone their oh yeah that's even worse <laughs> the other the other part of this though and you touched on this already I just wanted to bring it out a bit more is the there's a difference between knowing someone else's melody and also being able to hear that separate melody while you're playing your part. And yeah. that's a de- that's a separate skill set. But I think yeah. this is what starts happening um, when you get players who are uh, like what Eric was describing, where there's like this, there's this connection. Yes. You know, you're listening to the group as a unit and not as like a conglomeration of like 20 different people. It's like a, it's a unit that you're listening to. And I mean, I've experienced that most intensely yep. with jazz groups, but I don't think there's any reason why it only exists in jazz but i think it's just often a value that's kind of pushed up in that in those groups all right now i want to flip this a little bit okay sure so you gotta you gotta own this miss melinda Uh oh Um, (laughs) the the audience that they were playing to was you and there's a difference when the audience is coming in sitting down and aren't open or ready and an audience that is desperate for you to start the concert you were listening to them like you were willing to let magic happen. You were open and willing and anxious and give me what you got. Yes. Um, uh, yep. Like as a being, like you were the audience for them. And yep. They wanted to show you what they could do. Um, so that there had to be some kind of impetus for, for their wanting to perform for you. Yep. And an audience gives a performer energy. There's no... No, nobody will tell you that they don't, oh, sure. and they don't, and they're not participants other than listening. Sometimes, like you know, in a in a symphony hall, you're just yep. listening. But that listening energy, or in the case jazz festival, you know, we're up and just dancing, mm-hmm. um, and it seems like we're at one with the movement of the band and are predicting with the movement 
what's going to happen and we get thrown off it's joy you know because it's because oh you got us you know uh you teased us or or whatever um and and so they, there's that mix of performance you know people all listening to each other and then also there's there's some kind of receiving mm. you know yeah. that is that's extra you know uh I don't know what the best word is. I don't want to get too hooey fooey, but it 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 happens. There's a book called The Silent Pulse. Hmm. And the silent pulse part of the research that this guy did is like take a uh you know, high speed photography, like, you know, thousands of frames a second. Yeah. And then look at the way two friends have a conversation together and do hmm. the same thing with people that are not necessarily well acquainted Hmm. and you can get really super unbelievably close relationships between the friend but occasionally you can also do that with a stranger but mostly you can pick up this silent rhythm that's been happening the whole time Mm -hmm. it's what ron was explaining in uh a, a earlier episode um we had a guest on who explained that that there's there's just um help me bo um where um everything kind of just it just comes to a head makes sense Well, from what i've heard about the conversation research that people that are in rapport with each other will start if one person does a certain action the uh, a lot of the times the other party will spontaneously copy it like if someone crosses their legs the other person will cross their legs or their body postures Mm -hmm. will start to kind of uh, mimic each other that starts to happen when people are in rapport but i think you're definitely right that this translates to your audience i know uh i was watching a video of like gary gary burton like the great um uh, uh, vibraphone player and he was saying that when he solos he he wants to see the audience because he wants to kind of know if they're responding to what he's doing if he's yeah. if he's just getting too busy and they're not into it or or maybe maybe he's getting busy with the playing and they really are soaking it up he needs that to kind of go off of and i remember him saying in a video i watched of his he always pictures an audience when he plays if he doesn't picture an audience for him it doesn't feel like he's actually playing which i find very interesting i wonder if um i feel like this is what happens sometimes if you're a teacher and you're playing something for maybe a very interested or motivated student you can almost play better in that situation when you're playing for someone who's really interested and respects what you're doing i've found that anyway when i'm around if i play for people that don't kind of uh, respond to the genre that I'm playing you don't you don't get anything out of it but hmm. uh, especially when I'm around a student who's who's getting something from the lesson and they're excited about what you're doing it just causes this like excitement or this energy yeah. in your own playing yeah. that's really satisfying yeah. I I only have uh two students at you know at, at this time you know currently two private students and they're both so doggone good and so like highly motivated and they soak up the stuff I'm giving them like a sponge. So I'm just blessed in that both of my, you know, individual lesson teaching situations, they're very much into it. So when I play or sing for them, they're like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) they're just like, they're glued, they're glued to me. (laughs) They're like, a music instructor's dream. I brag about these students all the time. Like, don't you wish you had students like mine because (laughs) they are great. Both of them are great. Very different, but I just, I love them both. They're so cool. And one of them is a former student of mine from school. And now he's, and now he's in college and he's local. So it's great. I get it. I get every once in a while and I'll introduce a new song or play a new recording. Uh, for the kids to move to. Yeah. And there are really over the years, uh, half a dozen out of 20 years that I've been at Peabody, the kids will walk over to the speaker and stand completely still and just stare. And the <laughs> teachers want to get them like, no, Mr. Eric's dancing. You're supposed to follow Mr. Eric. And I'm uh-huh. like, leave that, the kid that alone. That was me, Eric. That was me. <laughs> Le- leave, him, leave him alone. Let him just yeah, be, yep. you know, just like, there's something going on and you got to let kids be who they are 
to let them absorb. There's some kind of magic relationship between. Eric, it's funny you mentioned that because I I recall that from when I was like six, seven, eight, like standing in front of my stepdad's <laughs> like giant stereo, and the sound that was coming out of it, I was there was just this like question like how is this possible like yeah this, what is this yeah, yeah. Like, I remember that well like, my right dad took me <laughs> so this is in the sixties and it's Eugene Ormandy with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I go down, and it's a Saturday morning performance, and they're, you know, playing Benjamin Britten, you know, Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. I just taught that today. And I don't remember a thing about it except the experience. I was like, I went to church for the first time. <laughs> um, you know, it was just me and my dad, as far as I remember. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if my brothers went or not, mm-hmm. and why, why they wouldn't be there, or I'm misremembering, because it was just this, you know, it's just like, what do you say about that? You know, there's, um, there's something that borders that, that magic, uh, the, the connection between performer and other performers you're playing with a performer and audience and, you know, mm-hmm. all that in the mix, plus certain styles that bring that out of you, you know, rhythm and blues yes. and jazz and, yep. yeah. you know, soul gospel, yep. um, that may not be the same for a lot of people. For it depends on, I think, what you grew up listening to. Yes. What you Because mm-hmm. I can. Oh, I can totally attest I to that. I can totally groove to, to Stravinsky. You know, like I have particular favorites and everybody kind of does. Yeah. You know, and the more and deeper you get into Bach, the more you have reference for the, the, uh, the, the, how far ahead at the time he was. Well, he's such a jazzer, um, you know, <laughs> and you can't not listen to him. With if you have jazz chops, you can't not listen to him differently, um, yeah, like that. that. So like, there's a comment. There's a whole soup there yes. that I don't think we know enough about. But it's like scratching the surface of these kinds of moments that we share with our students and elevates our being. So that we like, yeah. So that that's what I'm going after, and you can just keep going after it and going after it. And two years later, you might you know have a moment like that. There's times yeah. where I've played where. I just forget what I'm doing and everything comes out perfectly. <laughs> you know, you just, you just, you just hit the groove or you hit that magic flow. Yep. Um, you're just, you're just in and, and kind of helpless and, at, and at cause at the same time. Um, and it's, it's an interesting dynamic, interesting balance. And, you know, um, I don't know how many people have it, had those moments when you feel like you've let go and got rid of you know ego and there's nothing but space and time to play in yeah Mm -hmm. yeah you know so this is all wrapped inside of audiation or something and i think there's a uh uh, there's a book that i don't understand yet and i can't wait to talk to somebody who does understand it more uh there's a concept called space audiation and dr gordon who created the music learning theory and audiation mm-hmm. prior to that, and then prior to that uh, looked into music aptitude measures so that we could better understand and teach our, to our students uh, individual differences based on a whole gamut of information that we can only gather when we uh, administer a, a you know measure test. Um, people poo-poo these kinds of tests sometimes. Why mm-hmm. label the kid? Well, why label the kid? Because I want to teach better, you know? And the kid's not labeled like this is your upper strength. It's, you know, and your lowest, you know, low or whatever. You label them so that I can push the kid gently or strenuously, depend on where they're showing me their, their you know, their strengths and weaknesses are. Okay. So, I, have, I have two questions because... You sort of, they popped into my head now while you were talking, and and it's audiation related, maybe. Okay, so, uh, I don't want to forget them. So let me ask this, the second question first. Okay, sometimes I would have, this, this when I was subbing at the high school with the, the band kids again, I would have them do this thing where if we were like, say in a lesson, because it's a small, a small group of like, say, four, four kids. And they're playing their, their band music, getting ready for the concert. And, I, and they have something that's like, let's say, 12 measures long. So I say, okay, I want you guys to play 
the first four measures stop at the end of the fourth measure play the next four measures in your head mm-hmm. till the end of the eighth measure and then come back and play 9 10 11 12 and see how well you come back in together okay do you you understand what i asked them to do so mm-hmm. those four measures of outward silence but inwardly they're playing and ideally the tempo continues the pulse continues the blah 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 continues and then they put their horns back in their mouth and i say start to play no matter when so here's my question. Is what they were doing for those middle four measures of silence, is that in some way audiation? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It, and it might not always be. They're guessing, yeah. right? I'll and never then, know because I can't. And, <laughs> well, and then they, and then they notice... The leader breathes. The other kid, yes. Or like the other they, kid they, ha- they breathe, yes. and then they catch up. Like, okay, yeah, now we got to yeah, come I, in together. I, um, so, so you can cheat, but what you're explaining is if they're doing it and right, the, um, independently, and Eric, I'd just like to point they, out they are audiated. Too. Okay. I think the reason that Eric is using the breath as a metric because um, <laughs> it's basically. For you to naturally breathe on time without counting, not not like saying I'm going to breathe on beat four and it's very mechanical, but it's like they just, they take the exact precise length of breath they need before the phrase yeah. should start. Yeah. You see horn players do that and singers do that. It proves that they know they can really mentally audiate or hear where it's going to start. But yeah. another cool thing that's related to this that I've seen happen um, is if you watch good drummers play, yeah, when they're their limbs seem to be like fluidly predicting where they need to hit uh, a certain part of the drum, like long before it happens. Right. But when you see someone kind of mentally counting something, it can be choppy and it loses that, hmm. that kind of predictive flow. Okay. But that that's an exercise yeah. that I have students do hmm. a lot, like what you just did. And I, and I think singing is important to, to do it with singing and silence because mm-hmm. with the singing, they can't, hide the fact that their notes are not correct Uh, and i always give my students plenty of examples of i'll purposely make my voice sound like nails on a chalkboard to prove that you know i don't care about the singing quality Uh like so if you know because people get very sensitive about singing if they're not learning to be singers generally uh, instrumental students can Okay. Which I'm sure you're familiar with. So but my first, the singing can really validate that. Yeah. My first so here now my first question, which I won't forget because it's about me. Eric, I may have told you the story because it was when we had to do the sight singing tests for Theory Four with Mr. Monahan. <laughs> <laughs> I may have told you the story either recently or forty years ago. So okay. I wondered if this was considered audiation and I, I have hmm. Okay. So we had this little exercise book, uh, exercises in sight singing. It was dark blue with white letters and little green notes. And it was bound like those plastic ring bindings that look like this. You know what I mean? Is there a okay. Here? Probably. I don't know if they still use it today. All right. I can, I can see that book vividly. I remember, I remember oh, you that. Remember I, one of the and songs. I, and I, okay. And I had to sing it with, okay. with, with so Ray Suriani. <laughs> we w- oh, that's funny. I'll have to tell Ray that. So uh, you walk, you know, we had I to think. go in there and have the book and have to sight sing it. So for me, when I was looking at those exercises printed on the page, you see the clef, you see the key signature, you see the, the, the meter and blah, blah, blah. I have perfect pitch. So when I would look at the thing, Mm -hmm. I immediately heard it the way it would sound in the right key or whatever, if it were, if I were to be singing it out loud. So here's my question. If I walk in there and Mr. Monahan says, okay, turn to exercise number 43 and we all... (laughs) you know, turn to our pages, we know that pretty soon he's going to make people sing it. So for me, when I looked at exercise number 43, I immediately heard it in my head. Is that audiation? 
There, so I, I, it gets interesting because if you have perfect pitch, it changes for sure. But one of w one of the things I would say, um, even if you do have perfect pitch, you might not be inferring the correct harmony that could be underneath the melody. So if 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 you're in G and there's you know you see a bunch of G's, B's, and D's, depending on your musical background, you might think there's that's there's an underlying harmony of the G chord underneath this whole thing. Now, just because you have perfect pitch doesn't mean that you will audiate the correct harmony or, you know, air quote correct, because you could be you could be hearing different changes right. over over the same melody. But uh, that that's something that I think um, kind of has to be said for, it, for that. It, it's possible that you do that without context and it's possible you do that perfectly. Uh, also, exactly the same. So level. like if it, if this with, if it, say it was context. a blues say it was a blues melody and you you could be hearing the melody but you might not bring you know it might not be bringing the 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 form of the blues changes in to be sitting underneath that well, which that's is a interesting bad example to think of. because I most definitely would <laughs> well yeah, that, that's but that's why I use the, that's why I use the blues though because most people have or not yeah. most but a lot of people have that form yeah. in their mind already so you know it it, it would probably come along for the yeah. ride you guys but, it's uh, so funny all the stuff that we are talking about right now and it was even only a half day of school. But we have just touched on so much stuff just in this conversation that so many things that I employed or touched on just substitute teaching for a half day a few hours ago. You're a pure so example of somebody who, somebody who ideates in the wild. So much. Yeah. You yeah. said <laughs> Benjamin Britten's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. I totally use that. Today and the classes were only twenty minutes long because it was a half day schedule. I totally, yeah. you guys got to look this up. I mean, this is kind of off on a tangent, but uh, I'll have to get your emails and send it to you. the The regular music teacher sent me this link, like you know, do you know about something to do with this? So the music is Benjamin Britten's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, and the music is the soundtrack. To this short animated film, it's about 18 minutes and change, called Red and the Kingdom of Sound. And Red is this little eighth note shaped guy who's red. You, I, it's it's so cool. We didn't have time to watch the whole thing, so Red's journey was kind of like the bullet train, and then he was in Woodwind Land, and he was in Stringland. I had to go fast, but the film is very cool. The music, of course, is great, and I used an abbreviated version of that just today. It was so. I'll have to send you the links. Just watch the video, just for fun. Yeah. If you can use it, yeah. cool. But if not, it's just fun for you to watch. I had another question for you about like the sight singing stuff. Uh huh. Um, so when you, you know, in that situation, you saw the melody, boom, you hear it, mm -hmm. you hear the meter, you hear everything. Uh, do you hear it being played on a certain instrument or do you, do you imagine yourself singing it or what, what's the timbre of what you're hearing? Uh, uh, Cause if my, the pitch isn't an issue, my if gut, the pitch is. Yeah. My gut says when I look at it and I hear it, it's usually one of two kinds of sounds internally, piano or voice. Okay. That's, that's what I hear. Sure. Piano okay. or that's voice. Curious. Probably most, I'm going to say, P piano but here's the thing and i i may have told you this story for sure eric this teacher mr monahan <laughs> i think probably everybody who was my great my grade you know my year in college in my year i was the only one that had perfect pitch but there was somebody a year or have eric remember shelly mckee yeah yep. she she had it too so but the he in the my year so this teacher when we had to do our final sight singing exam like at the end of the year and we use that book right so we just to make it true sight singing we never knew in advance what one he's gonna give us so it's true sight singing first sight spontaneous uh you know never before seen or whatever so i'll never forget this so <laughs> You know, it's my turn, you know, okay, Melinda's appointment is at, you know, 2.10 p.m. for her final. And we all had like, say, maybe 10 minute increments or whatever. So I go in or whatever. And and the teachers are sitting there and the things. And then and the, there's a, the book is on a stand and they're there. So 
Mr. Monahan says, okay, I want you to sing number uh, 26. Turn the page to 26. Okay, so I look at it. I see, okay, it's got three flats, blah, 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 blah. But what he would do for everybody, including me, unfortunately, was he would give you the starting pitch, regardless of what you know where I'm going with this, don't you, Bo? Regardless oh, of sure. what was printed, <laughs> regardless of what it was actually supposed to sound like, he would just go start on this pitch, whatever it was. Now, in my head, I'm actually hearing the E flat that it starts on. This is, you know... Sure. for example, but he probably gave me some other junk, like a G or something. And so yeah. when he gave me the starting pitch and I look on the paper, I immediately know it's not the right, it's not the pitch that's written down there. So we had a little, <laughs> it was so almost now you feel everyone like else's an, pain. Uh, it was almost like an <laughs> argument. He gave me the pitch and I was like, no, it's like he, he'd go, uh, and I'd go, uh, 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 and he's like, he made me start on the pitch yeah. that he gave. This is an interesting point because and he wouldn't I let think... me sing it in the right in the actual yeah. key. So I I, I, I have trying to mess me up. This. <laughs> so because for you, what he was actually getting you to do was transpose. Because for yes, you, you knew what the you knew what the actual pitch. That's was. the nice but, way of explaining it. But what I think, though, I think if if, if you're a teacher, like uh, I, don't, I forget the name of the the teacher in the sight singing class, and they and they can validate that you Mr. have Monaghan. perfect pitch, yeah, I I don't even know what the value of that exercise would be for you because they, it's not it's not developing your skill set that you have that's extremely rare and hard for other people to get. Well, and I, I don't know if it's a good, uh, you know, if if the exercise was you're gonna look at a clef that's in the key of E flat. And and I want you to transpose this on the fly so, into sing it into the key of G. Then yeah, that yeah. makes sense to me. Which but, uh, I, which but I could weren't... do, but to this day, y'all, I yeah. wonder. <laughs> yeah. Was no, he but... a insisting on a different key because he knew I had perfect pitch and he wanted me to I'm develop sure. my transposition sure chops, or it was he B just he being was... defiant and saying he, you were going to sing was... on the pitch that I give you? I don't care what so, you have. So, Socially or developmentally, um, he was not a, a very high caliber. Which is why I think it was option B. Yeah, one I of think my friends was a, little, a flute major a and a had him. Deb, <laughs> Deb had him, Eric. You know, because she was a flute major, yeah, and yeah. his so you're right. His social skills. A, ooh, ooh it's not no. Mm -hmm. And he didn't move one lick. He was a frozen man except for his fingers. You didn't even sing his fingers move, and yet this beautiful Mozart. <laughs> Flying out He's of his so right. and there was no He's movement right. whatsoever. Oh. And Stone face. He would he would have tantrums in flute class oh. if if you didn't put down you know or take up you know your D fingering, right? Um, and the pinky, you know, if somebody left that D, uh, you know, I know exactly what you hold, mean. <laughs> he he would actually ha have a a breakdown, like almost a break, like a mental breakdown. Red in the face, stomping around. Five minutes, seven minutes of class would go to you know a mistake, or somebody who hadn't practiced. You know, like you know, why am I here? You know, you guys are here to serve me. Um, uh, kind of attitude. And, <laughs> um, I, I don't yes, know where we, to go. we digress. But, we the, digress, yes, Bo. Yes. This is what you got to deal with, Melinda, Bo. We when... went to the same school. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, well, I've met some characters on my end too. So. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, how old were you, like when you first knew you had perfect pitch? Because we know it has to be acquired early. But when yeah. did you actually recognize so, you had it and that other people didn't have it? I didn't know it was called something. I didn't know that it was something exceptional until I started taking piano lessons. Because before then, sure. I didn't know what notes were called and stuff. Do you know what I mean? So you so you could still identify them even though I just you didn't, didn't know, know I didn't have are. the language before I started studying an instrument studying piano I didn't have the language uh, so I kind so of does figured... that mean though when, when you went to piano class and your your teacher first showed you a C was it just instantly when when your Say teacher that first again? when you first went to piano class and what, your my teacher lessons? yeah your lessons uh -huh. and your teacher was like this is a C and played the note. Was it just instantly memorized that that was called C, that sound that you heard, like, from then on, like, that's just C? Uh, like, <laughs> I don't know, because 
I don't know. I, I don't know. One, it was a long sure. time ago. But like there was yeah. a piano in my house before I started taking lessons okay. and I would mess around on it, not knowing yeah. that this had notation on a staff and a letter name and all. I didn't know that's none of that stuff until yeah. my piano lesson. So I'll tell you. So boy, oh boy, this piano that we had, the, the F below middle C, the F a fifth below middle C was kind of twangy and wonky. And you know, it, it never ever did get fixed, but when you hit it, it was kind of like, I, 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 you know what I mean? So, uh, I, we were in the living room, me, my older sister and my brother were in the living room. I was on the floor playing with my Barbies. My brother was playing on the piano cause he's like somewhat musical too. So he's playing on the piano. I'm on the floor, blah, blah, blah. And I could, but, but with this ear, I could hear that he was playing and I knew that he was getting close to that F just because he was playing and he was like just noodling around. And I remember saying, I remember stopping playing my Barbies and turning around and saying, and I still didn't really know what the note was yet. Cause I was young, but I remember right. saying, you know, don't get too close. Cause remember that, that key around is broken. Do you know what I mean? I could hear that he was getting close. He was just kind of, duh, 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 duh. you know, I was like, don't get close to that key. Cause it's broken. It wasn't really broken. It just was, you needed to fix whatever. And, mm. and he, because he was much older than me and had more musical experience, he kind of played guitar. So he was probably like, I'm going to say he was like, probably like 18 or so. Okay. knowing what that that notes had names or chords or whatever he knew and he was like how did, how did you how did you know where I was how did you know that and i was like huh what then i went back to playing with my barbies cuz i didn't know that it was anything <laughs> special until i was in music instruction sure. myself and knew what stuff was called so yeah. so i'd yeah. probably say i was no older than 10 yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You but could you, recognize yeah. it, but not be able to But not really, know. Which is why, I don't know how much time we have left, but which is why, minutes? Oh, dang. Which is why my, well, young, to, my younger daughter, up. You call it, Bo. I believe, might have some form of perfect pitch, but I don't yeah. know how to test it. They play how, uh, trumpet. How old is she? How old is she? A, almost 19. Oh, okay, okay. But they, they play trumpet, which is a transposing instrument, so they really don't know what things are called on the piano, but there's just been other yeah, things that, that have nightmare. happened that make me go, ooh, I wonder if Jay has perfect pitch. How can I find out? How can I find out, you guys? Uh, and you were talking about that thing like, you know, in utero, was the mom dancing around and stuff? When I was pregnant with Jay... I was doing a lot of groups with guitar and the guitar would sit boom, right on my belly <laughs> was right on their butt. And guitar has a sort of E centric oh, yeah. thing. Oh yeah. And E became their note. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, I don't know how to describe it, but E became their note. There was a little toy tea kettle that when you pushed the button, uh, it whistled and it was an E and I just, I don't have time to tell you that whole thing. But have cool. you guys, have you guys heard about the, um, there's a Japanese researcher that has a method for, um, coaching kids into perfect pitch and the success rate is absurdly high as long as they start young enough. But the way, the way that he does is very interesting. Hmm. You go home with a recording of just like a C and an F chord. Um, and the you know there's a there's a triad right and uh -huh. it's the f is an inversion so it shares the actual pitch c is the exact same pitch between the two yes. it's not it doesn't move up or down an octave so what they do is the, the kids first start differentiating between these two chords yes. just c and f c and f and then they add a third chord they add a fourth chord and you do this like five times a day for two minutes each time so it's it's, it's an intense training you know it, it doesn't take that long in terms of time spent per day but you have to do it a lot during the day uh -huh. by the time you add like the seventh or eighth chord there's so many of the same pitches being played by two of the chords yeah. that the only way the kid at that age 
uh, can tell you the difference between the chords is by attaining perfect pitch and hearing the difference between the pitches mm. of the chords. So it's an interesting, uh, but the success rate I think is like, you know, in the 95 mm. range, like it's happening if you get them young enough. But after a certain age, people don't seem to be able to, which lines up with all the other research. Yeah, on it. I just want but to know if cool. she has it. Yeah, I mean, you could you could play you could play her some some pitches um, and and see if she can pitches outside of songs specifically, but also you could just play chords and see if she could identify chords. Uh, the pitches I'll, inside I'll of chords. I'll come up with something and they quit yeah. they quit trumpet, so that does yeah they they played trumpet, Eric. So that doesn't help. The transposing instrument thing is an issue with perfect uh, pitch exactly. because like that. Exactly. And you know, I see it's fun to talk about perfect, perfect pitch because Eric and I <laughs> don't really talk about it much. Podcast, but I've, you guys. I've, I've thought about perfect pitch a lot. But yes. yeah, the transposing thing is a nightmare because if you know that this pitch is a C, but you have to be calling it and reading it as a B flat when you're a trumpet player, like this is gonna drive you crazy. <laughs> well, unless or, you or if you want to so be playing a C and it's coming out B flat, so ingrained with yeah. transposing instruments sure. that it doesn't bug me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. We could have a whole another podcast just about this, you guys. But I wonder, I wonder if a lot of people with perfect pitch gravitate towards guitar or piano because you don't have to transpose anything on those instruments. <laughs> I don't know I because really I that. played clarin- bass clarinet and that's transposing, and I I love sure. it. So you're one of the few people, Melinda, that that actually. It tolerates it, it pretty well. A lot of people are asking have, have no, it. Don't, you need to don't spend more like it. spend more time around me. I really don't tolerate it. That oh, well. you got to be around <laughs> okay. me more to know how okay. I tolerate. Yeah, stuff. most most people that have it don't, wish they didn't. Kind of. So then, just, yes. just out of curiosity, then if you have, uh, uh, yeah, Eric's brought that up. Before. Yep. Um, Yep. Actually, I, I had a music composition lesson uh, months ago, and the professor I was working with has perfect pitch, and there was something wrong with his notation software where it's playing everything like 50 cents below where it was supposed to be, and it was just driving him crazy in the lesson. Like, I had no issue with it, but yeah, we ended up, he ended up wanting to like reboot his computer and stuff because it was just like, it's you, a, you know, everything just sounded off. It's a yeah. blessing and it's a curse. I am here to tell you guys. It's a blessing and a curse. I've had physical, visceral reactions <laughs> to pitch stuff. I mean, my yeah. stomach be clenching. I make funny faces. I tilt my head to the side. Ask my kids. <laughs> I mean, my biological and do you kids. Know, not I'm, my I'm students. assuming you do, but do you notice, like, you know, when you're out and there's a lawnmower on, like, that's an F, like, yeah. stuff like that? Yeah. Because like, yes, I, I can identify that's those when it's sounds. That's a curse. But... Yeah, that's, that's when it's a curse. <laughs> and now that I think about it, I know I had it when I was little, but I didn't know what it was because household appliances like vacuum cleaners, that was the one. That's when I was little. So so when you were little before you knew the names like we talked about, you knew that there was something similar about like the vacuum sound and the blender sound like they were the same like in your brain they lined up <laughs> if they yeah if they were the yes if they were the same pitch this is kind of weird but i do remember i always hummed along with the vacuum cleaner i don't know if did they have blenders in the mid 60s i don't <laughs> yeah. know yeah but they had so, vacuum cleaners what's weird though is like i did all that when i was a kid i hummed along with stuff if there were two sounds next to each other like the light and the fridge i could tell you that that was the same pitch and i've always been able to do that but yeah. it never turned into you know yeah. into what you have yep. yeah yeah I, I could do a study <laughs> on myself i could that's that could be a doctoral thesis right there i was yeah. sit. i was sitting psychological with... implications yes. of perfect pitch. <laughs> i yes. was sitting with a friend and um the yankees were playing um and when a opposing batter strikes out, there's this, right? And I just did it, but it, so, but yesterday when I whistled it, it was, um, it, so the Yankees had come on, but there was no sound in the room. Oh. Um, so, but when I whistled it, I said, I nailed it. That's, that's, that's the exact, I, I have like a recognition of that. Yeah, but I sure, can't sure. do it. I, there's no way, you know. I have yeah. so sometimes I I notice things like, oh, that's the same phrase what I just sang as this Elton John thing, and it's yeah. the there right. Are people, there are people that have talked about this, Eric. There there are people that they don't have full blown perfect pitch. They can't identify individual pitches, but they if they know a piece really well, like Rick Beato, like if you play, if you play like the Bach Goldberg Suite, 
he can tell what key it's in and he can he can sing it in his head off the certain key every time but yeah. he can't end he can't identify individual I, pitches i have no context. idea yeah yeah, yeah. 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 it's a I that's when it was the a curse timbre and the tones and the, the you know whatever it is i i notice it and i say that's exactly the same that, that occurs on this album or in this piece or like that, that certain relative pitch thing that i i kind of lean yeah. on sometimes it was a it was a curse when people wanted to me to do it like a like a circus trick, you know. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. Hey, Melinda, come here. here. Hold my F sharp, you know. I was like, no, no. <laughs> hey, Melinda, come here. What pitch is this? Brr. You know, I was like, oh yeah. oh yeah. Don't worry. That's that's why we haven't uh, made another you college do that. Uh, acquaintance who didn't have good manners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Neither of us really bef- befriended. So that's, that's that's interesting. Yes. Very cool. Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> this whole thing was cool. So and I yeah. know I can listen to it on Spotify. Thanks for that tip, Eric. I could what have asked we, my kids, but you know. What shall we title this? Oh. I don't know. Who knows? I don't magical know. Music. I don't know. That's up to is, you guys. Is, That's up to you guys. Music? I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know. Come up with a cool with a cool acronym. Let's see. We got E M and B. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> Me, Meb it doesn't work. Meb. <laughs> uh, I'll think of something. Yes, yes. You let me know. Let me know. You can like email me or text me, and then uh. The magic of music and an inquiry into perfect pitch. <sighs> yeah. Because we spent a lot of time on that. That's fine. That's yeah, good. this kind of happened. But it, it's it, it's interesting to talk to someone who has it about it because you know Eric and I can talk about it all day and it's in, and that's fun. But uh, yeah, you just don't often meet people that have it. So, Eric, some of your little three year olds might have it and you don't even know it. Yep. 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 So I'll if I figure out a way. I've I mean I've been wanting to do this mostly. I I'll, I probably like all my daughter's life. I was been trying, especially because I have it. I want because that could be a study too. Is it? I think it's pretty genetic. Yeah, I think it's highly genetic. Yeah. Um, and that that's actually I was talking about this before, but uh, the guy Rick Beato that has um, he has this. It's not perfect pitch, but he has like perfect recall for certain songs uh-huh, that uh-huh. are really in his bones. His kids have perfect pitch. See, um, both, but both so it's kids? likely. So siblings have it. He, I, he worked I think on it's mo- he worked on him really hard. Oh. His son, his son has a, a very powerful perfect pitch. Yeah. You know, he'll just play boom like yep. crazy chords on the piano, and his son's just ding 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 ding. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely <laughs> degrees of it. There's definitely a and it's fast like, too. Like his son has a, it's rapid. Like yeah, how quick yeah. he can identify. Them I too, think. So. Because kids are younger and have those more like, you know, flexible, plastic, malleable brains, they're going to do it. But if you ask me, well, my old, you know, hard wired brain, ah, it was not as quick <laughs> as I used to be. <laughs> so no, anyway, you're doing fine. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> but um, I, it's kind of I think it's very cool that I that I subbed today. So I'm kind of, you know, fresh out of the sort of uh environment and uh you know i've but i i have found that i i like i like elementary but my heart belongs to you know secondary level secondary level i spent more time teaching at the elementary level but my heart kind of is with the older kids that i think are tougher yeah i find that with i don't know for whatever reason i i get a lot of out of the older kids as well but I like them because I have audacity. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that was great. It was lovely to chat. Yes, definitely. Really great. Eric, I'm so glad that you like invited me to, you know, be in the, be in your podcast and stuff. Um, this was fun and someday between now and like late June. We're going to talk, and I'm going to yeah. tell you some of my pseudo-doctoral, faux-doctoral, yeah. hypothetical doctoral pursuits that I'm going to be doing. Did I, I did I tell you that Bo, when he retires, what he wants to do? What? 
go go for a doctorate in, in something crazy. Who? Bo. Oh, you. Oh. Bo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Eric, Eric a while ago was, we were talking about, uh, re- I think Eric was talking about retiring or something. And I was saying when I retire... I'm just going to get like a random, like something, something that I wouldn't have studied when I was younger, like, like theoretical physics or something, <laughs> something that's very time intensive, but uh-huh. you know, I, I've always had music as the center of my yes. time obligation. So I always thought that'd be fun to yeah. Yeah, go to school for something just totally different. Yeah. When I yeah. retire. Yep. My yeah. doctor, my yeah. doctor will be full and pseudo because then it'll be free <laughs> and I, I think, won't incur I think... any more debt. I got to double check this. I don't know what it's like for you guys, but I'm pretty sure in Canada, if you're retired, you can go to university. You can get a degree for free. Ooh, um, I'm moving. So I'm moving. That's then. part of, that's actually why I was brainstorming. Yes, this, that's great. Like, hey. and that's not the case in New York state. <laughs> Trust me. That is not the, I'm still paying back my grad school loans since I went, you know, relatively late oh, yeah. in life. So yeah. 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 Anyway. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Yes. It was lovely to meet you.